for those of you who can see me, I have my fingers and I'm demonstrating kind of like an ejaculatory technique would be to stimulate that urethral sponge. Mm -hmm. You can also thump on it really hard. That can do it as well. But only do that if somebody's super, super, super aroused. What are the common reasons that a lot of people today are having bad sex? And what are some ways that people can start having amazing sex? I definitely want that for the world. Yeah, amazing right. Amazing sex for everybody across the board, bucket list item. I could die happy if everybody's having amazing sex. Love that. But let's talk about bad sex. Yeah, so, start there. So bad sex, I think the number one reason, and I ask audiences this all over the world, everywhere that I've ever spoken, how many of you had a great sex education? Hmm. And maybe I'll get one or two people who raise their hand kind of tentatively. And I say, well, actually all of you had sex education. Every single person on this planet has had sex education from the moment that they were aware. And that is often, don't do it, don't talk about it, don't touch things, bad, 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 bad. And so we've made sex bad, which is why we have bad sex. I think that that is the number one reason is because we don't talk about this topic, because we don't have adequate sex education. Most of the United States and around the world does not have to have comprehensive, medically accurate sex education. And so if we don't have that, then how are we supposed to have good sex when we're expected to just know how to do things? It's like, if you're gonna play the piano really well, you need to learn what the notes and the keys are and how to play and practice. Yeah, Ken, conversely, if you're raised to think that playing the piano is some it's, shameful act exactly. that is not to be taught about. <laughs> then you're gonna be like, ting, ting, yeah. ting, ting. Mm. <laughs> exactly, you're, you're not exactly setting yourself up for success right. as a piano player. So I think that's the number one reason. Hmm. We have shame is shame, sex is bad, and we're all a product of sex. So therefore we think we're bad wrong because we came from sex. And then the other is then we're not educated nor do we talk about sex. Hmm. And, And then the last piece, and I think that this is a really important one as to why we're having bad sex, is, well, I got two more. One is that we don't have a lot of sexual health where we're paying attention to hormones, biochemistry, diet, and how all of that plays into our sexuality. Hmm. We don't have education also around sexual health that optimizes our sexual pleasure. And we've made pleasure bad. And so we work, 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 and we are stuck in our heads and we're not actually in our bodies. And if you're not in your body, which is where sex is, Hmm. it's the gross awareness of the body and the senses, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. Why is it? I mean, you're so right in that we are, I feel like, collectively raised with this stigma associated with sex but at the same time we live in such a hypersexualized society right there's like this insane dissonance i feel like like on the one hand marketing loves to exploit human sexuality but on the other hand we're to, we were brought up in this puritanical with this like puritanical right. lens through which we view sex right and so then we get these cross messages all the time and then when we look at educating ourselves about sex it's often crossed with what media is teaching and it's really interesting even working in the porn industry in the years that i was part of that industry and um you know when you're filming great oral sex you got to kind of have your head to the side and angled a certain way and like ah uh, hmm. Good oral sex is all in there. <laughs> you know, it's so like. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't know this about your background. Tell me, you, in what capacity did you work in the porn industry? So I would go to the expos, the big giant shows that they would have every year because I had educational videos. Wow. So I had created educational sex education videos that then I was looking at, well, how do we get these into the world that's a proper sex education and not necessarily these educational places where we're getting education from that isn't positive. Hmm. Do you think porn is is harmful to our sexuality? Do you think it's neutral? Do you think it depends on the person? I think it's how we use it, just hmm. like anything. it's uh, It can be very detrimental and it can create somatic habits. So a somatic habit is where, okay, you're watching porn and then you're doing the same thing over and over and over again as you're watching it. Maybe you're fast forward to your favorite parts, but then you're doing the same thing somatically and in the body that um, creates a rut which eventually creates a grave and then that grave becomes your only route to turn on and then when you're with a real person then that can be really challenging and that's where we get things like erectile dysfunction and things like that showing up because you have created a grave in your neurochemistry and in your biology that's going this is what i need every time in order to get to 
high arousal and high pleasure. So, and then also just the way people are treated within the industry, you know, like ethics. I'm a person who really believes in a lot of high ethical value. And so what are you watching and how are you supporting um, people who are doing that ethically and mm. creating, you know, there's like a whole feminist porn movement and how, how that um, then has those ethics and those values and the way people are treated within the industry. Yeah, it's super interesting. I mean, I'm of probably the last generation to know what it's like to get porn in the form of a magazine. Right. You know, in the <laughs> right. form of like still imagery. <laughs> <laughs> on the page. And how has that affected the brain? Like that's always really interesting to me because like how does a still image affect the brain versus watching video or being able to fast forward to that one point in the video? Yeah. I mean um, still images can still be hot. Absolutely. But I mean now it's like you've got VR porn, you've got high def porn. Right. How porn. is that affecting the brain? I did some of that once. I was like let me see, like let me experiment. I'm always experimenting. What's, what what's possible? <laughs> and it was just really interesting, you know, because you're in this world and then how is that affecting you somatically? How is that affecting the body? Because the brain doesn't know the difference of what's going on and what's real. Yeah. It's like biting into a lemon when you're not, when you don't have a lemon. Do you think one day we're all just gonna have like AI boyfriends and girlfriends and like it just the way the way technology is trending, right? Right. We're heading we're on a speeding train towards the singularity where at, at some point we're likely going to be able to upload our consciousness into into like some technobiological sum, substrate. Absolutely. And then there have, have all sex kinds with whoever, of whoever we want. Whatever we want. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And we can have different genders and yeah. you know, skins and all that. So I think it's really interesting and fascinating what may happen in the future with sexuality around that. And what would then constitute good sex, you know, on this good sex bad sex. I think then the other point that I wanted to make there was uh, presence. Hmm. And I think that that comes into our technology today. And how are we, are we using technology and porn and some of these tools to take us away from presence? Or are we using them to bring us into deeper presence with our bodies, with our senses, with what's happening right here, right now? And when you have, pre I always say, if I can teach one thing to make sex better for anyone, it would be awareness of this present moment. Hmm. And with awareness of, of this present moment, does AI bring us closer to that? Or does it take us further away from that? It's so great. And so you've created the erotic blueprint, which is sort of like love languages, but for your sex type, right? Exactly. Super, super interesting. Yeah, tell, tell us about that. So there are five erotic blueprints. Okay. Do you want me to go through them? Yeah. Okay, so the first one is an energetic. And an energetic is someone who's turned on by space, anticipation, tease, longing, yearning. In their superpower, they can have sexual experiences that go into multiple dimensions of awareness. And okay. so in that, you may hear of transpersonal experiences, something like, oh my gosh, I remember when we were soulmates from a past life. Like that's a very energetic type of speak. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as we collapse space, they lose eroticism. Uh, and you'll see, as I would explained some of the other blueprints, how that then ties into compatibility. The energetic can have orgasms without being touched. So like you and I could have energetic sex just sitting here because we don't even need to touch each other for that. So presence is their number one. Thing. Is it as fun though? Yes, oh my gosh. Really? The orgasmic possibilities are quite extraordinary. Wow, interesting. Did you see the Netflix show? Um, Sex, no, Love, and Goop. that you're on? Yeah, yeah so, no. So in episode two, I do a whole energetic orgasm with my partner where we are just playing and he's not touching me and I'm having orgasms. So Fully it, clothed. Fully clothed, yes. So Jeez. completely possible for energetics and very, very fun to play with. What do you prefer? Do you prefer like energetic sex or like the real deal? Hmm, I like them both, but that's my blueprint map. Definitely, and I'll share a little bit about that. So, Whoa. and why that would be for me, why I would like the energetic is like a doorway in to a different blueprint. I'm fascinated by this. Yeah. So no genitalia involved. No genitalia involved, hmm. but energy between the genitalia involved. Wow. Absolutely. I would imagine you have to be really high in like openness on the and suggestibility on the openness yeah definitely suggestibility all yeah. those tests you know where you're like just something suggestive like like this one where it's like okay open your hands open your hands hmm. for those of you who can't see me i have my fingers interlaced and my palms pressed together and i pretend that it's a block of wood and then try to open your hands well there's nothing preventing me from opening my hands it's just the suggestion that i can't open my hands like it's a block of wood Whoa. that then 
prevents me from opening my hands. So it's a very similar thing with an energetic where just the energy or the suggestibility or metaphor can take them into these high arousal states or multidimensional states of arousal. Wow. And if you've never had an energetic orgasm before, like what does that feel like? Okay. It feels like for me, um, like electricity is building in my pussy. And it's building, 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 building. And it's like sparkles almost, sparklers going off. And then that energy starts to move through the rest of my body. And I can use breath, I can use sound, I can use movement, I can use different tools to start to bring that through my body. And then as that bring goes through my body, it's like that uh, vibrational energy then starts to move through my entire spine and sometimes into my fingertips or my toes, but mostly up my spine for me. And then that keeps rising up my spine, rising up my spine until I start to get like um, out the top of my head or sometimes just a lot of energy in, into my head that then starts to create an expanded state of consciousness. So I go into like with, with breath work or psychedelics, the brain, I, I surmise that the brain is producing DMT and the pineal gland is releasing um, excretions that are causing some of these like visionary experiences and light shows and I get a lot of visuals too with it now. Whoa. And yeah. is it like the feeling of climax? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, for me it's better because it's not for me like a sexual climax is like a genital sneeze. It's kind of like <laughs> <laughs> a genital sneeze. A genital sneeze. Wow. Whereas this is like I'm taking the intensity of when about when you're about to sneeze and I'm bringing it through my whole body so that I'm having more of a a whole body vibrational experience. Mm. I'm never going to think, think about orgasm the same way again. <laughs> yeah, general sne <laughs> sneeze is such a great way to to think about it. Okay, so and that's average sex. Average sex, we have genital sneezes. Which there's nothing wrong with genital sneezes. Yeah. Sometimes a good sneeze is amazing. Yeah, but um, to have a different experience is it's the almost like pizza. Here. Like even bad pizza is it's good. Still pretty good. Yeah. You know, and even, then you have a delicious one every now and then when you're like, oh, my God, yeah. that was a pizza. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and okay. it nurtures everything. Too, it does. You know? Yeah. So your erotic blueprint is energetic. Primarily energetic. Primarily. So you can have more than one. Yeah. Everyone has a map of their blueprint. And so we each have different percentages of each one of these blueprints. But I'm highly energetic. Highly energetic. OK, yeah. so what, what are what's the next one? OK, so the next one's a sensual. And the sensual is someone who's turned on by all of their senses being ignited. So touch, collapsing the space, whereas the energetic loves all the space, the sensual wants to collapse it. So think slow dancing. Think of what we think when we think of romance around sex. You know, hot baths, chocolate, all the yummy things that ignite the senses. The superpower of the sensual is that they bring the beauty to the erotic experience. They're mm. gonna light the candles, put on the music, you know, have flowers in their space. But the shadow side of the sensual is that they're always stuck in their head hmm. um, because they're often thinking about, oh, that pillow's crooked, I mean, that, or I forgot to call that person. The, the mind gets running with the sensual and they get worried about things, bad breath, body image, and then they're not feeling the pleasure that's all over their body. Hmm. For the orgasm, like we were talking about with the energetic, the sensual is someone who can have orgasms anywhere on their body. So, you know, going down on them behind their knee. I like crevice sex, I call it, where, you know, you, you go into a crevice on their body somewhere and you go down on it like, you know, it's a vulva. Whoa. And then um, you've got really, um, my mouth starts to water when I start talking about the sensual. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. Crevice sex. Crevice sex. Wow. Behind the knees. Behind the knees. I've heard of that, or maybe I just like read it in Cosmo or something, mm -hmm. but like that's a erogenous zone for many people. Absolutely. So we have different erogenous zones. So there's primary, secondary, and tertiary erogenous zones. Huh. Primary erogenous zones are the places we think of, and they're often where there's mucous membrane, the mouth, the vulva, the anus, uh, the tip of the penis. These are places that are primary erogenous areas. Now, when we get into the secondary erogenous areas, these are the crevices. These are these places where the skin is just a little thinner. And so we often want to start with the secondary during sex. People think, oh, I'm going to go for the primaries because that's where all the juice is. But the primaries don't always get online until the secondaries have been stimulated in some way. They so need to I'm, be warmed up. Exactly. And so we can blow, kiss, lick 
on any of these secondaries, and then the primaries are more activated. And then finally, we have the tertiary. So tertiary is like the end of the pinky finger is a tertiary. Whoa. The ear in certain places is a tertiary. We have erectile tissue in our nose and our face and the roof of our mouth. And so some of these areas also can be, can be turned on as we go along. Mind blown. Actually, I knew that about the, ne- like in the, no- in the nasal, like in the uh-huh. paranasal sinus area, we have erectile, erectile tissue. tissue like analogous to what goes on down below. Yep. I think of it as a tube. You know, we we develop here and then we just go. And so we have analogous tissue between the bottom of the tube and the top of the tube. Fascinating. Okay, so the sensual blueprint, that I I feel like is pretty common. That's a little bit more, maybe a little bit more common Mm -hmm. than the energetic blueprint. It's interesting. So we've done the quiz now. Um, I think we've had a couple million people now fill out the quiz. And it's interesting to see the data and that we have, based on gender, uh, I think we suppose that men are a certain way, one of the certain blueprints I haven't got to yet, and that women are a certain way, like all women are sensual. And what we found is that it's actually even energetic and sensual between people who identify as cisgendered heterosexual women. And men are across the board, all five pretty much. Wow. Yeah, so that's really fascinating. Now, that could be people who fill out our quiz, but it's interesting to me to see that some of the things we assume are not accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Fa- so men are equally proportioned amongst... Amongst almost all the blueprints. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so sensual. Sensual sounds lovely. Yeah, it is lovely. Yeah. I don't know if I'm sensual per se, but um, but yeah, it definitely sounds like I've, I feel like I've romantically been involved with sensual types. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I guess the shadow, the downside is that they rely on that extrinsic, right, stimuli. Right. And they need to relax in order to have sex. Hmm. And so if a sensual is stressed out at all, it can be really hard for them to get into the space where they're like, oh, I'm just not in the mood. I'm just not in the mood. Well... Most of us, if we wait until we're in the mood, we're not going to have sex Mm. as opposed to just, okay, let's do the things that we need to, to get warmed up into that realm and into the erotic realm. And we live in stressful times. We do. We do. So all that high stress then is lowering libido and it makes sex not as good because then you're in your head, you know, thinking about all the things that need to be done instead of really paying attention to all the yummy, 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 yumminess that's in your body. All the yumminess. (laughs) Okay. So moving on. How many are there again? There's five. There's five. Okay, so moving on to number three. The sexual. The sexual. The the, sexual, but aren't they all sexual? sexual? Okay, so I have, this is an interesting story. I won't go into the whole thing, but I have a lover who he and I are energetic blueprints together. Hmm. And he's gay, which is really interesting, you know, because I identify, he identifies as a gay, heterosexual, not heterosexual, homosexual man. And here I am. And if we fell in love with each other 20 years ago. Whoa. I trip over my words when I talk about him because like we're very in love with each other. So <laughs> I love that. And so anyway, we've had this relationship that has been energetic and sensual. And then recently I was like, you know, we just don't meet in the sexual blueprint. And he goes, yeah, that's why you called them the erotic blueprints, Jaya, because we are very erotic together. Hmm. And I think that that's interesting how we we conflate sexual with erotic and that these other blueprints are actually very erotic. The energetic is very erotic. The sensual is very erotic. The sexual blueprint, and this is interesting because it may tell me a little bit about you and that you asked me that question. (laughs) (laughs) The sexual blueprint is what we think of as sex in our culture. So we think of intercourse, we think of nudity, we think of getting to the orgasm, we think of ejaculation, and that equals sex. Mm. And that's part of the shadow side of the sexual blueprint is that we actually have this limited definition of what sex is. Sex means penis inside of a vagina, moving, 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 until we have an ejaculation or some kind of orgasm that's happening. And so that's very limited when you start to look at the whole map of all the other blueprints. Mm -hmm. And so the sexual, the superpower, is that sex is simple. It's like pizza. All all pizza's good. And And so, and sex is something that sexuals have in order to feel relaxed. So Hmm. I said the sensual needs to relax in order to have sex. The sexual likes to have sex to feel more relaxed. They feel like everything's right in the world. Sex is like food, air, water. It's like, oh, this is something that I need. And I've had my orgasm. Now I can Interesting. I appreciate that. But I feel like, but so 
Okay, so they're all erotic, but not necessarily... So you wouldn't call the sensual blueprint necessarily a sexual... No. Blueprint? No. Nor erotic. Erotic. Mm-hmm. Okay. Eroticism to me is like life, art, love, beauty. It's these fundamental alivenesses hmm. of what it is to be a human and in a human body experiencing pleasure. Hmm. And so the sexual is just one aspect of that. The, so the sexual type just wants to get it on. The sexual type just wants to fuck. Just wants to fuck. Yeah. Got it. Is there anything like, and you you kind of mentioned that it's a little limited, mm-hmm. right? But when it comes to getting it on, there are so many different permutations. There are so many right? different like permutations. It actually, it's not that limited. It's not. And so sexuals actually don't lack depth. I would think that that would be the most common amongst men. It is the most common amongst men. Is it? Um, Well, we have across the board, but it is the number one, like the highest percentage. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So sexual. Are we getting like, are we progressing towards like, in terms of uh, like kinkiness or in terms of, is there, are these like arranged in any particular order in which you're delivering them or it's just they're in no particular? This is like the order that I discovered them in. And Got so it. the first one that I was like, oh, gosh, this person's wired, wired energetic. Yeah. And then I started noticing like a few days later, I was like, oh, they're sensual. Whoa. And then I started. So I started to like notice these in order. And, and there, so that's the order that I've been teaching them in. And there actually is a kinky. There blueprint. is a kinky. It's is the next not? one. Yep. Interesting. Yep. <laughs> OK. So the next one is kinky. Yeah. So the kinky blueprint. Tell us about that. <laughs> this one is somebody who's turned on by the taboo. I start giggling because taboo. We're Taboo's talking about fun. the taboo. Taboo is totally fun. Yeah. And so in the taboo, we have two different types of kinky. One is sens- one is more sensation based and one is more based on psychology. Got it. So, and some people are a mix of both of them. So I'll tell a little story about my partner, Ian and I. So we- um, How many partners do you have? I have five partners. So this is poly, is that what they this call is, it? Yeah, poly. Got it. Yep, it's a very interesting world. Maybe we can talk about it a little sure. bit more. <laughs> So the kinky is somebody who has this, uh, whatever is taboo for you. And so the psychological kinky is someone who really has the power dynamic aspect of it as Mm. part of their turn on. So my partner and I, we were six and a half years into our relationship and we were really hitting a slump in our relationship. And here I am, a sexologist. We had had a baby together. We were really going through a struggle and he would come to bed at night and he'd want to cuddle with me. And I would touch his genitals and I would be like, do you want to have sex tonight? Do you want to fuck tonight? And he would be like, ugh, and turned off by that. Hmm. So I'm approaching him in a certain blueprint. He's approaching me in a certain blueprint. And we're crossing wires, mismatched. And this was before I had the blueprint, so I wasn't privy to what was going on at this time. And I would roll over and cry myself to sleep at night because I'm the sexologist. I'm supposed to be having hot, juicy sex. Like, what is wrong here? And he, he would just get turned off by the obvious. I started strip teasing. I'd like have my butt in the air and my little G-string. And he'd be like, why are you doing that? Hmm. And it was turning him off because he's 0% sexual. Interesting. And I was highest in sexual at that time. I was sexual energetic. So these like change over time. They can change wow. based on life and where you're at in your life circumstances. Interesting. So but you, we have a default. We have a default. Yeah, my default is energetic sexual. Wow. So you were in your sexual power. Here I am in my sexual power and my partner just wasn't into it. Hmm. And then I started going, okay, well, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to commit myself. I'm going to make a commitment for this year to be all in in our relationship and to really understand who he is erotically. And after six and a half years, he admitted to me he was kinky. And this is the shadow side of, I'm, and I'm a sexologist, this is what I do for a living. I talk about sex for a living. So for my own partner to have difficulty coming to me to talk about this shows the shadow of the kinky, which is the shame. Hmm. Deep shame for the kinks that I have, deep shame for this thing that I consider taboo and not understanding why does this turn me on? And so once I discovered that he was kinky and very much a sensation kinky and a psychological kinky, I was then able to use tools and to learn, okay, all I have to do is put the red ropes out on the bed with a little note that says, don't talk. 
be ready for me in 15 minutes and I'm going to come in and I'm going to tie you up with these ropes and you're not going to talk. (laughs) and you're going to do what I say like to be in the power dynamic that now I'm in the power dynamic with him and the ropes were the sensation aspect he liked the feeling of constriction Hmm. and because that was a place of shame we went that long in our relationship without me knowing that that was actually what his turn on was and as soon as I knew that we were in wow had he known his whole life that that was and he had just kept it kind of like stayed in the closet about it or what I think he had a clue Hmm. um, that this was part of his turn on and then it got grew it got bigger because what often happens again shadow side of the kinky is that then you can start to fixate on the thing that turns you on because you're making it so shameful that it becomes then again an only route to turn on that can become a rut or a grave yeah because now you're fixating on that turn on that you can't have or that's not okay i think people should live out their kinks How do we create safe spaces in our relationships for people to out themselves? I think that's a really, really good question. I think there's two parts to that question. One, just safe spaces to fully explore our eroticism. How do we fully express who we are as erotic beings? And one is just asking, what do you need to feel safe to fully realize and express who you are erotically? I think we need more consent conversations, even in long-term relationships. and to understand what is underneath a turn on. Because maybe I'm not willing in partnership to fulfill your turn on, but maybe I'm willing to do the thing that's underneath that turn on. Maybe I'm willing to, okay, you want to feel like you're out of control. How do I create that that maybe has nothing to do with ropes and me bossing you around? You know, in Ian's case, the feeling of, I want to be doing these things, but I want someone else to boss me to do those Mm. things which then frees up the shame about those things. Hmm. So really what's underneath that is freedom. How do I then give you the feeling of freedom that maybe doesn't have to do with those things if I don't want to? Hmm. Um, I love dyads. They're one of my favorite exercises. What's a dyad? A dyad is when you go back and forth with something. So for example, um, I may say to you, if we were gonna practice this right now, tell me something about your sexuality you want me to understand. Tell you something about my sexuality that I want you to understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, man. I put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm pretty grateful that I've had lots of experiences. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And then you'd ask me the same question. Tell me something about your sexuality you want me to understand. Tell me something about your sexuality that you want me to understand. I am an incredible erotic being that is unlimited and really, really big hmm. that most people have no idea how to take to the edges hmm. because there are none. Beautiful. <laughs> and so you would just go back and forth with your partner doing that. And then that helps you to see helps you to get understanding about them and also for them to feel understood. Hmm. And that creates safety. When someone feels seen and understood, then they feel safety in that. When is the best time to have these conversations? Over dinner, during (sighs) sex? Not during sex. With morning coffee? (laughs) Not during sex. I would set aside time to like go, okay, we're going to sit down and we're actually going to practice this dyad together Hmm. and to remember that it's a communication not a conversation and what a lot of people will want to do is go okay well let's talk about that right now you want to just keep going back and forth and back and forth for like 10 15 even 20 minutes Hmm. with the same prompt tell me something you want me to understand about you and sexuality you know what i remember hearing somewhere and i don't know if it's true if 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 my memory is serving me correctly one of the best times to bring up these kinds of of uh, discussions is when you're driving because it's non-confrontational. <laughs> you're both looking ahead. <laughs> you are trapped in the car, but it's not, it, it feels non-confrontational. Mm-hmm. And there is a, um, a time limit, right? Cause like right. you're, when, once you arrive at the destination, conversation tends to shift. With my partner, Ian, we would play erotic games in traffic in LA. 
when we were stuck in traffic. And so I do things like oral oral sex where I'd give him like five naughty words and then Oral. Wow. I um, like that. And then he would uh tell me which ones of those words were the most turn on. And then I would know when we do like naughty talk or something like that later, then I could bring those words up. We'd play all kinds of fun games when we were doing we were doing an experiment, forty days of kink where I was dominating him for forty days and then he dominated me for forty days. Whoa. Yeah. What are some common kinks that people have? Common kinks. Well, there's a huge range. Well, we have um, sensation and then we have psych. So psychological, psychological kinks, some of the ones that we would see there would be like feeling as if you're surrendering or dominating someone. Mm. So what would you want in that scenario? And some people are switches, like my partner Ian is a switch. Is this BDSM? BDSM would be bondage, dominance, sadism, masochism. Got it. Yeah. I and mean, there's different things that they kind of mix up in the BDSM acronym world and what is a switch so a switch is someone who's both who feels both like they're dominant or submissive hmm. and then and then in within sensation we have like intense sensation play so things like spanking very common choking can be very common do that safely everybody who's listening again you ask about safety it's like consent and then also learn the skills like don't go doing these things um like what's the best way learning. to choke somebody <laughs> i learned this in acting school you which is you don't actually like go for like you don't want to really, really choke someone, you know, just having your hands a little higher up near the chin. Okay. And you want to go up, not towards. Up, not towards. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So then you're not like breaking anything or yeah. actually, you know, causing, any causing damage. damage. Yeah. Yep. Is there, is it, do people, do you think that people like choking because of the, like the power dynamic or is there a bit of like, you're cutting off like the wind, like how does it work? You know, what, like what's, what is appealing about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's not something I, I necessarily enjoy. There's a psychology of it. There's a psychology of feeling like that edge Hmm. of something. Like my life is in someone's hands, feeling the out of control. Like I'm surrendering to this experience. There's also just the breath play. Hmm. Breath can take you into these different states of consciousness when you're restricting breath. And then that can increase sometimes arousal. But I really love the idea that the more we breathe, the actual, the more we feel. Um, but breath is different for everybody in everybody's body. Sometimes holding breath will get you higher into the orgasm and tension will get you more into the orgasm. And for some people, deeply breathing will get them more into the orgasm. Wow. Yeah. So it's basically a little bit of both. It's like sensation and psychological. Psycholo- yep. Yeah. 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 So cool. Are there different, I've, there, I remember seeing studies put out by like some of these porn sites that different states have different, like the most searched kinks in different states vary. Oh yeah. And like in the South, you get more, I forget, I forget what they (laughs) are. The more repressed someone is or the uh, area is, the more that uh, you see these kinks. So our, like when, when I, we talked about me being in the porn industry and how I I was making these educational videos and our educational videos would sell more in like Utah, you know, where the most conservative sexual repression is than anywhere else. So wow. that was always fascinating to me. Like, yep, we're shipping another one to Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> That's so funny. I mean, they still have those like grandfather laws in some states, right? Yeah, oh, where yeah. you're not allowed to practice. Vibrators, sodomy, like wow. there are, th- these things are still illegal in a lot of, a That's lot of places. That's crazy yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. As long as you're not hurting anybody, I feel like adults should be able to do whatever the hell Consenting they want. Adults. Consenting adults. Consenting yes. adults, yeah. Absolutely. And even, I mean, some adults like to be hurt, obviously. You yeah. Know? I mean, I I know a guy whose whole profession is just like be- beating up people, like as kinky, like it's sexual. Like Damn. He, he's like this huge, like 200 pound guy and he just Whoa. like tackles women, you know, who want to be tackled. Like that's their kink hmm. is to be tackled. You will find everything and everything. There's a book called A Billion Wicked Thoughts. That's really interesting. It's like all the things people search on the internet and what is most searched for. Wow. And, um, it's it they did an art exhibit in new york city and they had like every from the top searched all the way it was just this huge wall and it was amazing to just see all the interesting things that are on there because if humans think of it we will find a way to sexualize it oh definitely <laughs> there's porn of any you can find porn of anything <laughs> anything yeah it's amazing and i understand yeah. most fetishes the one that i that i can't seem to wrap my head around is feet feet and it's so common it is very common yeah yeah i don't understand it but I mean, power to the people that are into power feet. Power to the people who yeah. are into feet. It's such a, it's like, 
It's like one of the cutest, cuter fetishes. It is cute. You know? And you can do a lot of things with your feet. I mean, training your hands to do all kinds of amazing things during sex. Some people get really good into training their feet to do all kinds of amazing things during sex. Yeah, super interesting. Where do kinks come from? Is it just like childhood stuff? That's a really interesting question because that was something that my partner asked all the time. It's like, Mm. why am I this way? Why am I this way? And questioning it all the time. And is it, was it nature? Was it nurture? Was it something that I saw early on in my sexuality as I was developing? And we really looked at that. And then finally we went to this uh, kink practitioner because I was learning all these different things. And he looked at us both and he was just like, why don't you guys just stop asking why and enjoy it? (laughs) And I was like, wow okay, we're going to stop asking why then and we're just going to really enjoy that this is the turn on. Yeah. Amen. So you said that you have five lovers? Yes. Is that because there are five blueprints? You have one for each <laughs> no. blueprint? Or but is that just a really coincidence? that's a really good idea to have one for each blueprint. I kind of do have one for each blueprint, but <laughs> it's just a coincidence. Very, very, very interesting. Okay. <laughs> do you so want to hear the last one? Yes. We spent the most time on the kinky one. That also gives me some information. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what can I say? You know, I I think like I I think you should try any everything. You know, mm-hmm. at least once, mm-hmm. and then it's okay to have preferences. Absolutely, but absolutely. even preferences, and I this is, I mean, mainly something that I feel mostly towards food, but that you should always re always reassess. Like you should always revisit your preferences and challenge them, especially as you get older. Yeah, I agree with that. Change. Absolutely. And then what if what freedom you have when you have no preferences? Yeah. That's and that just is a life thing, you know, of like, okay, I can go anywhere, be anywhere, and nothing disturbs me because I don't have preference. Yes. You know? Yeah. Prefer loosely held preferences. Loosely held preferences. Yeah, I'm you know, so I, about that. I don't want to live in a dumpster, but I got to a point in life where I was like, if I live in a dumpster, yeah. So be it. But I prefer to live in luxury. Of course. Yeah, exactly. I prefer 100% grass fed, grass finished beef, you know? But if I'm traveling and all I have access to is the is the industrial stuff, I'm not so rigid that that's yeah. gonna be off limits to me. Which I used to be. I used to be like so rigid that if I couldn't have my grass fed, you know, thing, yeah. milk or whatever, then yeah. I'm going to have a meltdown. Yeah, we can't be rigid. I know. I have a lot of friends that are that are rigid in many ways and I kind of, To me, it evokes the feeling that something happened in their childhood or they were like really enabled in in like their rigid attitudes towards whatever it was, food Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. entertainment or whatever. Or it became a way of controlling in a chaotic environment. It was an adaptation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, uh, I always think it's like kind of a shame to have that mindset about things, whether whether it's food or sexual proclivities, travel. Um, One of my practices I did to help me out of that was to see if I could make everything pleasurable and orgasmic, even if it was something I didn't like. Hmm. And the day that I knew I succeeded was this one day I I was really ill and I felt really nauseous and I was like, oh no, I'm gonna throw up. And I hate throwing up, it is not a kink. Worst thing ever, (laughs) don't like throwing up. Who likes throwing up? There are people for whom throwing up is a kink. Wow. Um, Hard limit for me. (laughs) (laughs) And so at any rate, uh, there I was and I knew that it was going to happen and I went, okay, here's a moment to practice not having preference. Here's a moment to actually turn this whole thing around and make it orgasmic. And if you've ever tried making throwing up orgasmic, so here I am and I'm like, I'm gonna make this pleasurable and it, I went into, instead of labeling this as something bad, instead of labeling this even as throwing up, can I go to the pure, raw, energetic signature of what this is? It's just a lot of intense sensation and movement of stuff out of my body in the opposite direction. Hmm. And I did it. I made it an orgasmic experience. And I was like, all right, kudos to me. I don't know, <laughs> superpower. I can now make anything orgasmic. And so sometimes, when I have the awareness to turn that on, I can go, okay, wait a minute, let me make the experience that I'm in right now that I would normally label as painful, wrong, bad, and turn it into an orgasmic opportunity. Hmm, powerful. Mm -hmm. So it's like throwing up now a thing that you're into? No, still not a thing I'm into, but if I have to do it, I know that I can make it orgasmic. You have like the toolkit. To, I have the toolkit to, to do reframe it. the experience at least. <laughs> Life mission for me is what is erotically possible? And can we 
just keep discovering what is erotically possible. And for me, I've never found the ceiling of what is erotically possible. There is no ceiling to that pleasure. There's no ceiling. I love that. I love that mentality. Okay, so the fifth and final erotic blueprint. <laughs> the fifth and final erotic blueprint is the shapeshifter. The shapeshifter. The shapeshifter. And the shapeshifter is someone. Sounds like a Marvel superhero. It, it is a Marvel superhero. It's someone who's into all of it. So it has the capacity to be energetic, sensual, sexual, kinky, plus their own shapeshifter nature. So they can move between all of those pretty fluidly, hmm. especially if they have them all developed. And so the shapeshifter is an ultimate lover because they are able, to, they don't have limit. And so they're able to really speak all the languages. So if these were languages and a shapeshifter has a partner who's, let's say, sensual, let's say the sensual speaks French, the shapeshifter is multilingual. So of course they can speak French. The trap of the shapeshifter is they're always speaking French. Hmm. And they're therefore the most starving out of a lot of the blueprints because they're always shape-shifting to meet their partner or shape-shifting to meet other people's needs and they're not getting their own needs fed. The other shadow is that they're often told they're too much. And so in telling them that they're too much, then they start to shut down aspects of themselves instead of living really into their fullness of hmm. who they are. Wow. Is there value? Well, obviously there's value in knowing your, your blueprint because then... You kind you of know become you're, a better lover. You become a better lover. <laughs> you know what you're working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super. You have better sex because you know yourself. Hmm. You know, I think that that's a, we talked about you know, bad sex at the top of the show. Yeah. Part of bad sex is that we don't know who we are erotically, and because we don't know who we are erotically, how can we expect anybody to really pl please us if we can't communicate what it is that we need, want, and desire that's actually going to turn us on? And so the erotic blueprints give us a language to help us become better lovers, but also to be fed in our own eroticism. Hmm. And when did, you, when did you come up with these? So I was working with a client and I'll never forget that day. I was in my office and I was hovering my hands over this client and he was having trouble feeling aroused, feeling like he wanted to have sex with his partner and getting an erection. And she had been trying all the sexual techniques. So sexual blueprint techniques of, you know, pogo stick, jerk offs and all the all the oral sex 101s and all the things that she had learned and none of it was working and so there i was i had my hands hovering over him and all of a sudden his he just started waving his body started to undulate subtly and, he, and then he started getting quivers all through his body and then he got an erection and his eyeballs opened really big and he looked at me and he looked at her and she looked at me and we're all looking at each other and he goes what is happening and I said, you're an energetic. Hmm. And all of the space being collapsed and all of this pressure to get turned on and all of this friction was actually turning you off. And all of your eroticism is in the space between and in the longing and the yearning, not in the collapse of the space. Hmm. And so from there, then he can move forward, understanding that, oh, I need all of this space in order to actually feel because the energetic is so sensitive that if it's like doing a cannonball in a lake, you're big splash as opposed to if you just dip your finger in the water and let it ripple slowly you're going to get a whole lot more eroticism out of them a whole lot more turn on out, out of them if you go very slow and very subtly into their system and into their field when it comes to like pair bonding i mean mm -hmm. can somebody who's an energetic type have a successful relationship happy successful enduring relationship with somebody who's sexual, sexual? or kinky yes absolutely 100 percent and the, here's why. It only takes willingness, and it only takes one person who's willing. So in a relationship, if you have an energetic who's willing to learn how to not override themselves, because the shadow side of the energetic, which we didn't talk about, was actually too much, too quick, too fast, shuts them off, and they dissociate from their body, and they often override that because they think they're weird, right? Like, oh, I should want to have my clitoris touched, when actually just hovering over the clitoris, a little bit of breath on the clitoris is, might be a whole lot more effective for them than rubbing really hmm. fast and hard. And so, but they have to be willing to go, okay, well, let me examine the shadow aspects that have me not want to be sexual. And, and look at that, because often there's unhealed trauma there. There's often a nervous system where the vagus nerve is like, not very tone and so you've got this hypersensitivity that's happening in the system which can be a gift but also can be with a sexual 
a challenge. And then the sexual has to be willing to go, let me slow down. Let me say yes to this world that I have no idea even existed before. <laughs> Let me say yes to this thing that like I'm hovering my hand. I don't feel anything, but they're like waving on the table and having orgasms. I don't know what's going on, but I'm just going to say yes to it. Um, that's definitely Ian's practice because hmm. he didn't have, I talked about our percentages. He was zero sexual. I was zero kinky. And he's primarily kinky sensual. I was 5% sensual. He was 5% energetic. So wow. we were completely flip-flopped yeah. in the way that we were, but we both had high, high willingness because we love each other so much of going, hold on, well, let me go study. Let me go find out in the Venn diagram of who we are erotically where my turn on lies and where his turn on lies. So in the energetic, his turn on lies and teasing me and teasing me and teasing me until I'm like, please bug me because <laughs> <laughs> I have sexual right underneath my energetic. Right. And so then he wanted me to just beg. And so that turns his kinky on hmm. that he's just going to keep teasing me and not give me the thing. And so he plays energetic kinky with me. Wow. So you're primarily energetic mm -hmm. with a side of sexual. With a big dose of sexual. Big dose of sexual, but 0% kinky. 0% kinky. I wouldn't, well, yeah, that's not something that I would have guessed. But in my work, I'm a complete shapeshifter. Got it. Because... I've developed the ability to work with and talk to all of the erotic blueprints. Yeah. Yeah. But my default is always going to be energetic, sexual. I feel like they need to put space for this on our, our like online dating profiles. I agree. Right. 100%. Because then you could go, oh, wait a minute. I want to date somebody who has this blueprint mapping. Yeah. And then we can see our compatibility. I want to date a kinky. You want to, I, I figured you would. I mean, a why kinky they... sensual for you. Well, it's like, I wouldn't know what to do with an energetic to be, to be <laughs> frank. <laughs> You know, I mean, it sounds sexy AF, but I just like, I don't know, you know, like I'd be like waving my hands around. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I would know what to do. Yeah. Well, first thing is just, can we do a little exercise? Sure. Okay. So hold your hand above your arm. Okay. Okay. And then take a breath. Let's see. Okay. Okay. And then just tune into your palms. You mentioned super um, like heroes earlier. You can do an Iron Man palm. One of my friends, Reed Mahalko, always says, just turn it on like you're Iron Man. Just imagine. Use your imagination. <laughs> and then get a little closer and see if you can just feel the heat coming off of your own arm. Yeah, I can feel the heat. And then there's like little hairs on your arm. So you could very slowly start to, with your palm or your fingertips, just barely, barely touch those little hairs on your arm. And make sure you're breathing. Because most people stop breathing. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely stop breathing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can go very lightly with your fingertips on your skin. Very, very slowly and very lightly let your fingertips just go right on your skin. Okay. And then you can, you know, get in that crevice there in your own arm. Do you feel anything? What am I having crevice masturbation right yeah, now? Or what? Crevice masturbation all the way. Oh, we just masturbated together. Woohoo! This is getting lewd. <laughs> I like it though. I'm not complaining. So see how you're like doing this? Yeah. Try this. Like very, very, very light fingertips. There we go. Okay. What'd you notice? What'd you feel? I felt like I was fingering my elbow. <laughs> it's very sexual. <laughs> or of you. the interior, yeah. <laughs> Super sexual. So, yeah, I think you have a high sexual in there. Do well. I? <laughs> yeah, I probably, I'm probably somewhere in that. I think you're probably like a mix, kinky sexual, <laughs> and you are attracted to sensuals. Attracted to sensuals. Let me think mm -hmm. about that. Sensual. Yeah. That has a lot of openness to it. Yeah. Although I'm not the most like conspicuously romantic guy, so I don't know if I would match well with somebody who's sensual. Because sensual, you said they it's mm -hmm. like the rose petals on the bed mm -hmm. and things they like love that, all that right? Kind of, yeah, they love yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah. one of the, if you're a sexual and you're with a sensual, one of the biggest tips I have is just spend five minutes cleaning up the bedroom and taking care of like little odds and ends, hmm. and put on some music. Have a really good sexy playlist. Ooh, I like music a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Maybe I'm part se it's sensual. I think you've got some sensual in there. Music to me is like, I love that Basquiat quote, music is how we decorate time. I love that one too. Yeah. It's so good. It's so true. I always have music on. And uh, it's, yeah, for me, it's such an amazing way to, yeah, just to like always live with like a soundtrack mm -hmm. to your, to, to always have a soundtrack to your, to your every moment. 
yeah. you know? Um, I'm way more of a music listener than like a podcast listener, which mm. is ironic because I Run have, a podcast. A, have a podcast. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So think about music that has you feel your body hmm. and ha- you that you really feel in your body that isn't necessarily like dance, like thump, thump, thump music, but like has a sensuality to it. Put a blindfold on the person you're with, put some music on, and there you've just increased for a sensual. You've just increased their pleasure. Hmm. Is there a way to get a sense of what the other person is when you're, for example, first getting to know them Mm -hmm. on on a first date, for example? Absolutely. Pay attention to how they are. So, um, do they touch you? Do they touch themselves? Do they touch their clothing? Do they twirl their hair? Um, when they're eating little moans, these are, these are sensual, Hmm. you know, and energetic is going to be more reserved. A light energetic feels very delicate in their system. So there may be a delicacy that you can tell. And Hmm. you can even tell when I start talking about it, there's more space between my words. When I start to talk about the energetic. Sexual is going to be much more forward uh, around sexuality, talking about sexuality, sometimes licking lips, you know, these kinds of sexual cues that we get. Hmm. Um, Kinky is a little bit harder because a lot of times there's shame there about what turns people on. But if you start to hear them talk about things that feel a little outside of our norm, then that could be a sign of kinky. And if you're seeing a little bit of everything, then you've got a little bit of a shapeshifter there. But I say, why not just take the test? You know, a couple dates in, take the test, start talking about sex right off the bat. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Start talking about eroticism right off the bat. Hmm. And that, that could be a little different than like, we're going to have sex now, as opposed to, well, let's talk about these things. Let's have an adult conversation as adults who are interested in perhaps pursuing this with one another. What are you into? What do you like? Who are you? Who are you? I'm interested in who you are. Yeah. Is it appropriate like first date conversation, you think? I mean, for me, I wouldn't beat around the bush, but um, yeah. <laughs> I like to just say, okay, when if I'm dating someone, I'm like, send them the quiz ahead of time. Wow. That's before I even go out on a date, but that's me. Before I'm very, you even go out on a date? I'm very direct. I yeah. want to know. I want to know, like, are they, if they're a yes to taking that quiz, they're compatible with me. Yeah. If they're a no to taking that quiz and they're not interested in having conversation about sexuality, I'm not interested. I feel like it's different coming from a woman. Yeah. Than coming. I can see that. You know. I can see that. But also like. It would be terrifying. Ian was the first guy who said he had sex toys. And I was like, okay, I'm into you. You have sex. You have your own sex toys. Hmm. But I'm also a sexologist. So I give that, you know. Yeah, I get it. I feel like sex toys have to be like replaced partner to partner. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a... Well, if they're your own personal sex toys. Yeah, I guess if they're your own. Yeah. Yeah, all good. This is super interesting. What about what about for people who are feeling undersexed? I mean, I think this is a really important mm-hmm. conversation to have for people who have access to partners, you know? Right. But I think, you know, I see these statistics all the time come across my news feed, and I, I don't really ever take the time to vet them, but I feel like we're in this time where people are chronically undersexed. I agree. Like we're just so distracted by our devices and entertainment coming at us from every which way, mm-hmm. begging for our begging for our eyeballs and um, How are you spending time with your body? Hmm. I think that's the first what brings you pleasure? How can you make this moment right now even more pleasurable? And for everybody listening, I really like how can you make this moment right now even more pleasurable Hmm. and is that just becoming aware of your breath and deepening your breath is that changing the position you're sitting in is that running your hands across your skin is that putting some delicious chocolate in your mouth what is it that we can have as a practice throughout our day that brings attention and awareness to our bodies and to the pleasure that we're experiencing in our bodies in this moment I think most of us put our attention and awareness on pain and things that feel like they're not right or distress and we could be really feeling pleasure instead. And that comes to everything that has to do with our senses, our touch, our smell, our sight, taste, all of it. And then what's your self-pleasure practice? So we have yoga practices. We have all these different practices that we do. And we have habits with our telephones. 
So could you put your phone down for 10 minutes and instead do a 10 minute pleasure practice? And there's all kinds of practices that you can do based on your blueprint. So if you're an energetic, maybe it's 10 minutes of light touch on your skin, like what we just did. If you're a sensual, maybe it's pouring yourself a hot bath and taking a hot bath and doing a little bit of self-pleasure all over your body during Hmm. your hot bath. If you're sexual, what would your masturbatory session look like? Um, that includes your genitals. If you're kinky, how can you play with yourself? And I don't recommend tying yourself up at home. That's dangerous, especially in California where you could have an earthquake when you're tied <laughs> up. Um, <laughs> don't that. do that. Yeah. Um, but what are some of those things that you can do that would have elements, you know, is it slapping your own skin to bring that sensation and awareness right to the presence? Um, and if you're a shapeshifter, how can you do a little bit of everything? So what are the pleasure practices that you currently have? And by being in pleasure, you're keeping your sexual pilot light on and you're keeping like your that. eroticism alive. And you want to have your pilot light on because if you don't have your pilot light on and it's off, then when you are with a partner, when you do have those moments of opportunity, and, and I also want to say that sex isn't just something that happens with a partner. I think that we have this misnomer that I need a partner to be sexual. No, I'm a sexual being autonomously all by myself. And I don't need any partner, even though I have five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, uh, these are champagne problems. You're, you're one of the lucky ones. Uh, um, when it comes to masturbation, there's, uh, or just orgasm in general, I feel like there's this notion, and I don't know what, school of thought it comes from i feel like maybe it's like ayurveda chinese medicine i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure but i've heard that when orgasming it's some this is something that that depletes mm-hmm. men of their energy mm-hmm. and charges women up mm-hmm. and uh and so you kind of see online now especially with the with the trad movement there's like this um push towards semen retention mm-hmm. and things like that are any of these like topics familiar to you of course yeah 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 okay so Um, i started out in tantra elaborate please so i joke oftentimes like the tantricas are like yes you can ejaculate as long as you draw the sexual energy out of the semen and you're pulling it up through your spine and and enlightening the brain and bathing the brain in that energy i don't know what any of that means (laughs) so (laughs) So wait you uh, uh, semen as far as i know the urethra is a one-way street yes. and semen's only coming out. They can injaculate. Injaculate. Yeah. So there is a, is a way to learn how to injaculate, to pull it back. And okay. so they would start, the yogis would start with like water, honey, and then they would use milk and tra- draw it through the urethra back up and in. And so this was a practice that the yogis would do. Um, but this is a, this is energetic. So semen could still come out your penis, but now you've pulled the energy, the vital life force out of the semen and drawn it up the spine and into the brain. So, Interesting. And this yeah. is Tantra. This is Tantra. Got it. And so in Taoism, however, then they're like, nope, you only get so many ejaculations in a lifetime. Once you've ejaculated them all out, you know, this is, this is the end. You've only got so much jing and then it's gone. So, you know, I don't, I don't, the Taoist doesn't seem so fun. And I had some, some clients who were Taoist who practiced this very religiously and they got infections a lot because I think we're supposed to ejaculate. Mm. You know? <laughs> like it's healthy for us to ejaculate and to have the fluid move, you know, not just stay stagnant. So, 100%. um, you know, I, I don't ascribe to that as much. I think that it's okay to practice every now and then and learn the techniques and learn how to draw the energy through and learn how to be able to last as long as you want to, mm. you know, and have control over that ejaculatory response. But, and then we have like the shamanic viewpoint and the shamans are like, let's ejaculate and, and celebrate life. Let's like ejaculate as much as possible through a party. You know, how can we, um, play with that even more in Hmm. terms of creating different states of consciousness and celebration of life. Interesting. And so I, I think all, you know, we can play with all three. It's really about finding what works for you. And I've seen everything in my practice from the Taoists. I've seen a lot of tantricas. I've seen a lot of people who are like, yeah, ejaculate. I I need to ejaculate a lot and celebrate this. And it really comes down to like, what's your biochemistry? What, what blueprint are you even, you know, And, and how all of this can play together. I had a client who every time he ejaculated, he would get major, major prolactin. And not be able to like like sleepy, couldn't get an erection for weeks, like 
And so that can be effective to learn then how to do semen retention Mm. because the biochemistry is affected so much by ejaculating. And yeah. ejaculation and orgasm are different. I think that this is something that a lot of people don't know, even know, is that they're controlled by two different parts of the nervous system. And so you can learn how to separate ejaculation from orgasm and become multi-orgasmic, uh, even if you have a cock, you know. And so women, too, we learn to ejaculate. And um, I think for women, it's been more separate, and we're learning now how to combine orgasm and ejaculation. And for heterosexual men, it has been more like we've had this... Um, mixed together Hmm. these two things when you say female like ejaculation are you talking about squirting squirting that is what i'm talking about yes (laughs) is that a myth or does that actually not a myth no 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 it's not pee it's not not pee pee. at all no as prostate specific antigen in it i've met women who claim to squirt and not even they know what it is yeah well, they should research more about yeah. what it is. I think we need more sex education research anyway. I mean, we need to look at these things. But yeah, For no, sure. it has prostate-specific antigen in it. It has glucose in it. So it is not pee. It can have some urine in it just because it's coming through the urethra. Mm. Um, but same thing, we have a urethral sponge that the urethra runs through. And inside of that sponge, there are these little parourethral ducts and glands. And so what will happen is that that sponge fills up with fluid, and then it empties into the tube. Now... For a lot of people, they gush, they don't squirt. And so gushing is more like you just get super, super wet all of a sudden. And if you're squirting, then it you have to like time that kind of right to where- I like the hand gestures. I, yeah, 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 this is my inside the vagina hand. <laughs> <laughs> is that where the G-spot is? The yes. female G-spot? It's the urethral sponge. Interesting. And so for those of you who can see me, I have my fingers and I'm demonstrating kind of like an ejaculatory technique would be to stimulate that urethral sponge. Mm-hmm. You can also thump on it really hard. That can do it as well. But Ooh. only do that if somebody's super, super, super aroused. Okay. And then, and then to time it, if they're going to squirt, you have to pull those fingers out so the urethra is not blocked. And then push out the person who's receiving has to push out and then that will create squirt. I've also seen people who ejaculate copious amounts of fluid where it's like buckets of water. That's what I've, yeah, I've heard. Yeah. But to me, I mean, I've never personally seen that. So it's like Mm -hmm. kind of, it's like Bigfoot. Right. You know, I've heard it. I've heard of it. Heard of it. It's like Bigfoot. But I've never actually seen it. But I'd be down. I'd yeah. be down to see yeah. it. Well, I hope Sounds you have like a, a Bigfoot good time. sighting somewhere in your lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> me too. You and me both. Um, yeah, but this is something we demonstrate. So we show like... So any... All women are capable. Everybody has a plumbing. So as long as you have the plumbing, then you're capable of having gushes, squirts, ejaculations, ejaculations copious amounts I mean, but some people are just a little different wow you know just in their makeup and and also i think it's a psychological thing so many people are afraid of peeing that they squeeze and then most i mean when i learned to have an orgasm i would pull up and i think people who have vulva bodies pull up and squeeze when they're having an orgasm and so we don't think about pushing out and so I had to learn to do the opposite. Instead of pulling my orgasm up and through my body, I had to learn to push out at the moment of orgasm so that the ejaculation came with the orgasm. So you're speaking to a lot of women right now. What should they do? They should push out the next time they're experiencing? If you're interested, I mean, I think, so this is the interesting thing about talking about orgasmic possibilities. I think people think something's wrong with them if they're not experiencing it. And I just want to say, you're not wrong. You're not broken. If you're not having these kinds of experiences, it's just nobody's, teaching you all of these things yeah, but you're teaching us like these like easter, easter eggs like built into our own body it's so cool <laughs> it's, it's so cool you have lots of easter eggs in yeah there. I mean, it's amazing <laughs> and so and so I when i, I talk a, <laughs> when i talk about it it's just to share what's possible a lot of times at our events we'll we'll talk about or demonstrate something that's possible and then everybody starts to experience it Hmm. And it's only because it's like the four minute mile, you know, Roger Bannister run that ran that four minute mile and then 36 people that year ran it. Whereas before it hadn't been done. And I think that's the that's the interesting thing is that 36 people ran it in that same year. It's kind of like the concept of simultaneous invention. Exactly. It's like that there it's evidence in a way of a collective consciousness. Mm hmm. And then it becomes into the consciousness, and then now it's a possibility, so then it's contagious. Amazing. 
So I want all orgasms to become contagious. Same. <laughs> we can all have genital sneezes with ejaculations if we want to. Uh, <laughs> why are why are so many guys into no fap? We're heading into November. There's no nut November. It's like a trend. It's trending on like Reddit. People are into this like abstention, right? Almost mm-hmm. as if it's like a this, this aspirational thing, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I think that we get into extremes. And I think we're in a time in in culture and in consciousness where there are these polarized extremes. Mm. And I think we've always had them. I mean, we can look at something like Tantra. And we, ha- we had the ascetics at the time. And only spirituality was for the people who renounced the world. And that was how they then became enlightened. And it was only males who could become a Buddha. Then the, the tantricas came along and they're like, no, 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 left-handed path. And the left-handed path is all the pleasure and all of the things and all the foods and the sex and we can stay householders. And actually women can become Buddhas here. And so we start to have these polarized extremes and then they battle against each other. And I think that's the nature of our world. I think we have a dual world. And what I'm always interested in is, well, how do we, in a polarized society and in a world that is based on dualities, and I think we have dualities so that we can understand ourselves. I think everybody's just seeking to understand who who am I? Hmm. And maybe my path is to go down this road where it's more renouncing things. And maybe my path is to go down deeply, and that's been my path, deeply down the world of, no, let's use the senses, let's use the body, let's utilize being in the world to attain these enlightened states of consciousness or understanding of who we are but we need the duality in some way to really understand well who are we and the same goes for eroticism who are we as erotic beings we create dual reality so that we can understand that yeah and it would be amazing if people didn't feel so inclined to to go to to such extremes right right Right. like if we could all kind of find a comfortable place Mm -hmm. in the middle where we can experience both right? right And I think that that comes to what state of consciousness you're looking at things from, you know, and and can you come to find that middle path? A Buddha talked about the middle way. And so this middle path that for me, sexuality is inclusive of everything. Here we are. It's an integral theory of sexuality. I think the blueprints l- literally show us where we're limited because I think we're all shapeshifters. Hmm. And there's not these polarized, you know, sexuals and energetics. It's actually that we all are shapeshifters, but we've been programmed and conditioned to not be all of who we are erotically. Yeah, I love that. At the beginning, you mentioned one of the reasons why so many people have are having bad sex is because they don't they're not looking after the health of their bodies. Mm-hmm. So as we sort of wind down, this conversation, I feel like we could we could go on for hours, but we can go on for hours because you know we were we're moving all that sexual energy. Yeah, we we're learning not to just ejaculate it all out at there once. There you go. It would be tantric <laughs> AF. Yeah, we're having a tantric podcast. Today. Yeah, we are very tantric. What are some ways that people can? Because um, I'm sure you know better than anybody, optimize the health of their body so as to promote better sexual mm-hmm. health. I think of our sex hormones as our youth hom- hormones. And I think we hear from doctors, you know, like, oh, you're normal for your age. And I'm always curious about, well, how do we actually not be normal for our age? (laughs) How do we optimize our hormonal health, which has us feel more youthful? And one of those ways is to continue to be in pleasure. That's why pleasure first, because when we're in pleasure and we're having sex, our bodies go, oh, we're still procreating. Let's stay alive. Let's stay vital, let's stay healthful. And so, and I know you know a lot about this, like diet is really important. I'm always looking at four factors. One is what's happening in the physical realm. Diet, biochemistry is the second one. So what's happening in the hormonal realm? And then what's happening in your psyche-emotional realm? How is psyche-emotional affecting maybe biochemistry or vice versa? Uh, Trauma, is there unhealed trauma that needs to be processed and worked through? And then the last one's what's happening on the bioenergetic level. And so we're looking at all four of those with any you know, sexual health challenge or anything that's coming up. Really, that's part of your blueprint map. There's, there's who you are as your blueprint type, but also what are those obstacles and pathways that we can optimize within biochemistry, within the physical body, scar tissue? This is one that people don't think about with sex. And it's one that I come across frequently in my practice, which is how is scar tissue in the pelvic floor from a surgery, any midline scar, affecting the flow of sexual energy? Interesting. 
Yeah. Where did these scars come from? Yeah, like episiotomy, so childbirth, tears, uh, C-section, any kind of midline surgery, Hernias. hysterectomy, mm -hmm. adhesion, infections. Uh, I mean, adhesions that are created by infections. Wow. So if you get repeated infections, that can create adhesions in the body. Hmm. Strengthening mm -hmm. the pelvic floor is probably important, right? Oh, yeah. It's like this like net that holds up all your bits and pieces. Absolutely. And it's uh, and I think like our, our modern way of life you know, chronic sitting, sitting yeah, <laughs> um, has caused a lot of these muscles to atrophy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's not just strength, but it's also, are we strong? Are we resilient? Are we capable of feeling? So I, I kind of measure the pelvic floor health based upon a number of different things. Because for some people, strengthening, they're actually like gripping. It's not strong, but there's like a grip that's held there. So learning to push out, doing reverse kegels is actually better for their pelvic floor than the tightening all the time and, and doing that. You have erectile tissue that's sandwiched between the muscles and the pelvic floor which when you're squeezing the pelvic floor, I'm doing it right now. Everybody do it with me. Um, when you're squeezing the pelvic I'm doing floor, it too, guys. yay! Um, <laughs> you're squeezing your erectile tissue and you're pumping blood into the erectile tissue, which then starts to vitalize the body even more. Wow. So when you're sitting in traffic, just sit and pump your pelvic floor and then you're squeezing the erectile tissue and creating more vitality and life force in your body. How do you apply progressive overload to those muscles? Because we talk a lot about on the podcast about how to grow other muscles in the body, mm -hmm. you know, often. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a, you got to add resistance, right, mm -hmm. after, after a certain point. So flat-footed squats, but are flat-footed just staying in the squat, not going up and down. And, and then you can put something inside the anus or inside the vagina that has weights on it. And wow. so you can buy weighted toys and products that then you could just hold while you're squatting. What are these um, called? So uh, there's something called the pelvic gym huh. that is a uh, weightlifting for also like the whole, you put it around your penis and then you lift it. Um, <laughs> you can also get like, so there's uh, little toys like an egg that then has a string or a thing that can attach to it that you can put weights, different stones or things, you know, that kind of give you weights for your vaginal canal. Um, so you just put it up there and then you stand, I would assume, you can stand, stand. while standing? I made a mistake. The very first time I got one, it was a egg, one of those vaginal eggs. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I can wear it all day long. And then I wore it to yoga class. And here I am in yoga class and the thing just keeps falling out. <laughs> Because <laughs> the muscles after yeah. a while get tired. Yeah. But yeah, no, you can you can get weightlifting for your pelvic floor. I wonder if you get like sore, you know, like when you get, have a good workout, you get delayed onset muscle soreness. I've never experienced muscle soreness in my pelvic floor, but hmm. but I'm guessing you can. You could get sore. I haven't heard of that, but and they have the same thing for your butt. Same thing. Wow. For the anal sphincter, so different sphincters, different muscles, and learning how to isolate and play with those. This is when I was 19, this is what I used to do for fun. Amazing. I would sit around and go, okay, a wait hobby. a minute. <laughs> Let's see, anal sphincter, isolating that. Okay, now I'm isolating, stopping the flow of urine, that one. Okay, now deep in the vaginal canal, now I'm doing that one, and then I would wave them and do all, because in the tantra they say, you know, penis inside the vagina, and then the penis doesn't move, the vagina moves. Right. That was one of the tantra techniques that I wanted to aspire to. So I, oh, so I that's practiced like a, that's very like diligently. Thing. Yes. Wow. Man, <laughs> Learn, I've learned so much. Yay. Let me, any like last minute, like uh, any foods, any like when it comes to diet, dietary pattern, mm -hmm. um, any, any, you know, ways of eating that you found to be particularly promotive I've been sex. all over the place with yeah. this. Uh, you know, it kind of, I've done keto, I've done raw foods, I've done macrobiotic. I have gone all different ways with diet and support. One thing I'll say is you want to make sure that you're digesting your food well because the, there's nothing, there's no bigger boner killer than having a oh, tummy. Oh, yes. You know? 100%. Or gaseousness. Yeah. So yeah. foods that digest well. That's sexy. Yeah. I used to think fruit was really sexy. You know, fruit is like the reproductive organ of a plant. And mm -hmm. so, you know, fruit before sex or fruit during sex can keep blood sugar stabilized, depending on the fruit. Yeah. You know, some can spike. But um, dates were one of my favorites to dates. have. Yeah. Hmm. 
But I deal with low blood sugar, so I like dates because they kind of keep my yeah. sugar going. I think red meat. I think like steak, you know, steak is a sexy food and it digests so well, mm-hmm. assuming you have good, adequate stomach acid. <laughs> um, you know, these days I go with what makes my body feel really good and makes me feel really sexy. That's pretty much it. Because I used to be neurotic. Like we mentioned I used to be really neurotic about my food, and then that would that was not sexy. No, you know. Yeah, I think one of the sexiest attributes in a woman, because um, I'm attracted to women, is uh, a healthy relationship with food mm-hmm. and their bodies. Because mm-hmm. I feel like, especially living in LA, you encounter so many women with fractured relationships with food, their body, body image issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, all that women stopped for me. Beautiful women that hate their bodies I've encountered. Yep. And have really rigid dietary patterns. And um, it's such a, it's, this is, a, LA is such a crazy town. It is a crazy town that way. Yeah. And it was interesting. I was 210 pounds before I came to LA. And then I lost a bunch of weight. I looked amazing when I was in LA, like, like stereotypically amazing. But I was the most neurotic I had ever been mm. in my life, psychologically around food and around body image and all of that. Move out of LA, did a bunch of healing. And I just was like, this is insane. And I love myself. And I think that that underneath all of all of this conversation that we've been talking about is how do you move into unconditional love for you from you? And when you move into unconditional love for you from you, the choices you make in your life, the way you eat, the way you think about yourself completely changes. And that's what happened for me. You know, I was lucky enough that I had a moment in my life where I found that love for myself and that stopped all of that neurosis Hmm. and really good sex when you love yourself Yeah, because everything's just cherries on top. Yeah. And you can speak up for your own needs and your boundaries and everything else. So loving yourself is really key to great sex. It's really key. Love yourself. Beautiful. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. 